I'd like to talk this morning about being salt in society. From my earliest recollections, I can remember my mother pointing out to me that if I wanted to be on the television and get on in the world of show business, I'd either have to expose my body or sleep with the directors. Now, this sounds like a sweeping statement, but the more I consider it, the more I realise she was absolutely right. Well, for a girl at least. You see, I was quite plump as a young girl and had a fear of being taken advantage of, so I decided it would be better to explore other ways of earning a living. But if you have any degree of talent or a bit of exhibitionism, the stage holds a tremendous attraction. I was used to performing vocal and instrumental solos before audiences in school concerts, and the applause, even to my young ears, was heady. You see, I, I felt I was good at something, a value, accepted, and this gave me a, a glowing sense of self-worth. Well, not being content to just sing in the bath, it was a natural progression for me to move from school circles to church circles. I had a West Indian friend who also had a good voice, so we rehearsed hymns together, singing in two-part harmony. When I was a kid, churches were not as sophisticated as they are today, and pastors did everything they could to encourage young people to find a niche. My pastor often asked my friend and I to sing during our regular services, and after hearing us, pastors from other churches would also invite us to sing in their, for their congregations. Sometimes we'd even be booked to sing at conventions. And now we really felt we'd hit the big time because we were actually given a ministry gift afterwards. Our style was very primitive. We'd ask the pianist whether they could play or not to accompany us whilst we sang. And after just one brief run through before the meeting, we'd perform without microphones to an accommodating audience who used to beam smiles at us. They all wanted to encourage us, and they did. But when I reached 16 years of age, I was asked to join a group. Now, this was totally different. We all played various instruments, and each song was treated in a completely different way. We practiced our material for weeks before, before performing anything publicly. We'd work on introductions, endings, vocal backings, and only when it was as good as we could get it would we bring it to the church. We became very proficient and were regularly booked by other ministers for services and conventions. Actually, after returning from our tour in Holland where we'd performed in some of the Dutch churches, we felt it was now time to expose ourselves and begin playing in the world. Now, this was, of course, the ultimate. We'd now be salt in society, getting work in pubs and clubs, singing a few worldly songs and mixing in some Christian songs. And this way, we'd get to witness in a way that would be acceptable. How else were we to affect the world? If people wouldn't come into the churches to hear us, then we would take our music out to them. We talked about our plan over and over together, but couldn't feel right about it. We booked ourselves into recording studios and made albums. We began to get bookings for concerts and all the time waiting for the right person to come along to spot our talent and put us in the big league. We did everything we could to be professional in our performance, from the clothes we wore to the way we held our mics. We advertised ourselves, but still God kept us hidden. I do remember one occasion when we were asked to provide the music at the 21st birthday party for a friend of ours who was a professional model. She wanted to sing and she asked if I'd do a duet with her. And because of this, she asked if she could buy me a dress identical to the one that she'd be wearing so that we could look really good together singing. <laughs> but after seeing what she had in mind, and realising that I was going to try to be a witness at this worldly do, I declined her offer. Well, we sang all the right songs as far as Christianity was concerned, and then we had a giggle accompanying our friend with her song, which was Big Spender. But it was only after this song that I realised what we were doing. We were just entertainers. 
we lapped up the applause, of course, but and the men tried to the men tried to flirt with me. The guys in the group ate the food and drank the alcohol. And except for the fact that we went to church, we were no different from any of these other worldly people. On another occasion, I was asked to do some session singing with an internationally famous hairdresser. He was putting on an elaborate fashion show in London, and to make it even more unique, he wanted to incorporate a love song. In his very sexy Swiss accent, he sang the male part whilst I sang the female part. And he did his part very convincingly whilst I tried my professional best to get into the song. But knowing that he was a self-professed homosexual made me feel unbelievably uncomfortable. I I blushed and he could see the discomfort I was in and he reveled in it, becoming even more teasing with his manner whilst looking right into my eyes. I think that was the worst job I've ever taken on. And it made everything to do with show business and fame filthy, corrupt and false to me. Many years ago, I happened to see a television interview of Sheena Easton. It was a documentary, actually. The programme was very educational because it traced how she'd actually become famous. She'd started out as a pub and then a club singer and was noticed by a talent spotter who offered her a record contract. But in order to be promoted, she had to succumb to quite a number of changes, both physically and musically. She'd started out as just an ordinary, good-looking girl. But they cut and restyled her hair, gave her a complete makeover, and changed her style of dress completely. She looked totally different. Then they chose the songs that she was to sing. The effect was quite astonishing. She didn't look or sound anything like the same girl. But it made me realise that fame comes at a cost. You may think you can become famous and carry on singing about God, but show business is all about making money. If it don't sell, you can't do it. You too is a classic example of what happens to Christians who try to break through into the world of show business with the idea that you can be a witness. They have all ended up in the occult, preaching for Satan instead of the one whom they once called their Lord Jesus Christ. At one time, I went to concerts to watch famous artists perform. I've seen some extremely gifted stars and admired their talents. But all these people were displaying themselves and showing what they could do. In some cases, performers were so technical and could do so many clever things with either their instruments or their voices that I was left cold. There was no emotion in what they did. Other times... The artiste would manipulate the audience so that they were all swept away on a wave of emotion which would end up with the crowd on their feet giving rapturous applause. Stefan Grappelli was one such performer who, after playing his jazz violin, had the crowd on their feet in adulation. The applause was long and thunderous. Nobody worried about his lifestyle or character because it was his talent he was displaying and people recognised and appreciated it. I felt totally detached as I watched him and his male backing musicians take their bows and wave after wave of applause went up. I thought to myself, he's acting like a god. Only Jehovah should be receiving this kind of praise. We now have Christian superstars, people who want attention, people who love the praise of men and want personal glory for their God-given talents and gifts. I was going in that direction too, but God allowed me to go through the fiery furnace to knock out all desire for wealth and fame out of me. Churches have become the equivalent of moral clubs into which we bring both fashion and entertainment. If you want to know how much salt the church is in society, just look at the churches which are attracting the biggest congregations and you'll see plenty of society in the so-called salt. We can't influence the world by becoming part of it. The two just don't mix. We have to leave the world and the world has to leave us. We have to show a completely different lifestyle. 
If what we do with our God-given talents and gifts doesn't bring the conviction of God upon those who observe us, then we're at best just entertainers who've lost our way. God's interested in changing people, not systems. If you're salt, you'll make some sort of difference wherever you are, whether you're aware of it or not. When I was 25, I worked in an advertising agency. I actually loved that job. I suppose the whole ethos of advertising is to be creative and think of new ideas which will capture everyone's attention and sell products. Well, everyone who worked there was an extrovert. Didn't matter how bizarre your opinions were, whether personal or to do with the job, everything was valued and nobody was discriminated against. When I shared that I was a Christian and went to church, nobody mocked me. But neither did it impress them, because there were others working there who were New Ages or atheists, and one secretary in particular, her name was Hillary, she had such a filthy mind that even these very worldly blokes would blush at things she said. Before this job, I'd worked in offices where there was so much backstabbing and cattiness amongst the secretaries. But here, you could be as crude and brutally honest as you liked, and nobody batted an eyelid. It was all seen as expressing yourself. It was whilst I was working at the advertising agency that my pastor started preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Wow, did that teaching batter me. I'd been going to church my whole life feeling blessed at what God had done for me. But I was now faced with how I should be living for God, and it devastated me. Up until t that teaching, I never realised how wicked my old nature was. I remember feeling totally crushed one morning after hearing yet another of these sermons the day before. I really wanted to be Christ-like, but I had so far to go. During the course of the day, I needed to get something from Hillary, so I went to her office. She must have just made a mess of something that she was doing on a typewriter as I opened the door, because the, the air was blue with all the curses bellowing out from her mouth. <gasps> she said, I'm sorry, I didn't realise it was you, Joanna. I wouldn't have spoken like that if I'd have known it was you. I was really surprised, and I told her it wasn't a problem. She didn't need to apologise. Oh, yes, I do, she said. You're holy. You know, her words stunned me, and I looked at her, trying to detect mockery in her eyes. But all I could see was genuine honesty in her face. I practically ran out of her office to the ladies' bathroom. I stared into the mirror. I wondered what it was that she'd just seen in me. I burst into tears. I'd felt so hopeless that day, but she must have seen Jesus in me, and he'd made this foul-mouthed young woman embarrassed. Well, very soon after this incident, a young lady in my office eventually came to the church after multiple in invitations and got filled with the Holy Ghost before she'd even asked Jesus into her heart. Wow, the firm started buzzing. Without even an invitation, Hillary asked if she could come to church with me. And she came with two of her cronies, whom she was always at work with and she spread the word about the church in the agency and one of the bosses together with two more of the staff came. It was like a little revival and I began holding Bible studies and prayer meetings in the lunch breaks. I wasn't there long after these occurrences. God called me to full-time ministry but my remaining days at the agency were so exciting. Don't underestimate salt. You don't need much of it to make a difference to any meal, as you well know. All Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego did was remain standing when everybody else bowed. They didn't actually do anything. All Daniel did was continue praying as he'd always done. His lifestyle didn't alter in any way. But look at the effect these men had on their society. If this lockdown restricted you or altered your habits, then... You need to realise this world still has power over you. In my wildest imagination, I just couldn't imagine either Jesus or his disciples wearing face masks and, and gloves or not meeting with others and having fellowship. 
We need to be aware of the things happening in the world today because Jesus said, if salt loses its saltiness, there's no way it can be seasoned again. So may God help us all. God bless you.